And, you know, there were certain aspects of, you know, preparing for this that were unique and, um, you know, the kind of between the hair and makeup, which took like quite a few hours and uh, wearing a pretty kind of a pretty major costume um and then and then some of the sort of physical aspects of the the training that was associated with the role it was different to, to anything i'd done before but um all really helped to make me feel kind of more more like the character and uh, i got to work with some amazing people in in the process across all those, all those departments. taking on a part like that in a marvel movie you know it's going to be incredibly hard work is that the first thing that you sort of think about because it's a very different kind of acting, isn't it? Mm, yeah, I think I was kind of nervous about how potentially the sort of size and, and the scale of the movie and the spectacle around kind of Marvel movies would sort of, I don't know, kind of uh, maybe just intimidate me out of being able to kind of do my job properly. Um, and, and what really helped in that regard was just how welcoming James, our director, was and the, the original cast members were, you know, that kind of new day at school sort of feeling kind of really, uh, really quickly dissipated when I learned just how sort of down to earth and, and sweet everyone is. And they really try and have a kind of a, a, a good time on the Guardian set. And uh, so, yeah, all of those things kind of melted away pretty quickly. And then, you know, there were certain aspects of, you know, preparing for this that were unique and, um, you know, the kind of between the hair and makeup, which took like quite a few hours and uh, wearing a pretty kind of a pretty major costume. Um, And then then some of the sort of physical aspects of the the training that was associated with the role. It was different to to anything I'd done before, but um, all really helped to make me feel kind of more more like the character and uh, I got to work with some amazing people in, in the process across all those, all those departments. I love the idea of New Day at School with Sylvester Stallone, <laughs> Van Diesel and Bradley Cooper all looking at you going, yeah, what have you got? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> how, how the heck did you get on this set? Yeah, and I was asking myself the, the same question kind of all the way through. Um, but... Everyone's everyone's so great. And they're a really tight-knit bunch. You know, they've been doing these three films over the, the best part of a decade. But doesn't so. that make it harder to be the interloper? <clears throat> it does a little bit. Yeah, certainly. I, or at least I was I was nervous about that. But but they're, they're so kind of welcoming. And, and, and they talk about the set, you know, as kind of like being a real kind of family atmosphere. And I think that's true, you know, across the cast and crew. Everyone's got to know each other so well. So it just feels like pulling up a seat at the... The, the the table with with a family and 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 you know they're they're passing you the food it's it's really lovely. I think that um, your training for the role actually started quite a while ago in in the pandemic when mm. when you just started getting fit. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. I mean, I, I've been lucky enough to kind of find that so for me, kind of physical exercise has been really really helpful with regards to my mental health, and so I sort of embarked on that uh, as a means of kind of you know sustaining kind of a good level of sort of mental health a number of years ago and that's something that I kind of relied on more heavily during the pandemic kind of indoor workouts and uh, you know like a lot of people having to kind of improvise with whatever they had in the house or in the garden in order to kind of uh, yeah try and stay fit but it was more about kind of sustaining myself mentally and then I had two jobs post the pandemic Um, or I should say, you know, post kind of strict lockdown where I was able to go back to work that required me to kind of be in some kind of uh, sort of enhanced physical shape. So I had a kind of head start, you know, before I even auditioned for Guardians. And then um, when it came to getting that role, I just kind of ramped up the training. And I was I was lucky I got to work with uh, Ben Carraway, who designed my program. Aaron Deer was my nutritionist. And then Daryl Richards was my other trainer. And between those three guys and... Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of time and patience on their part. I was able to kind of do it in a way that was safe and natural, and also meant that my like long term mental health didn't suffer through the process because it's hard work. Mental health is something that you refer to quite often, and also mm. campaign um, for in various different guises. Why mm. is that something that that so concerns you? And and actually, I, I've always imagined that choosing a career as an actor must be a really difficult thing to do if you struggle um, with mental health issues because there are so many opportunities for Mm. you to feel very bad about yourself, no? (laughs) I mean, obviously, there's some good ones as well, but it's very much about highs and lows, isn't it? No, I think think you make a very valid point. It's certainly a kind of double-edged sword. I think, 
you know, first of all, my attachment to mental health as a subject matter and my my want to kind of talk about it is because I have lived experience of mental health issues and, um, you know, long been diagnosed with anxiety, depression and OCD. And so living with that, you know, um, it's always been a part of my life. So naturally, I've wanted to kind of destigmatize it. At the same time, I'm sort of partly reliant on my mental health struggles in order to kind of do my job because it allows me to access certain emotions. Um, and then again, in doing my job, I put myself in situations that, you know, are a strain on my mental health. So it's kind of a rock and a hard place. But um, then again, you know, I, I, I ultimately wouldn't change it for as hard as I think I've found, you know, my mental health issues to be. Um, I'm grateful for them at the end of the day because it helps me appreciate life in ways that I don't think I would be able to were it not for those those struggles. Um, how yeah. do you how do you deal with um, people's um, interest and uh, extreme nastiness on on things like social media? You know, particularly when you play parts that provoke a reaction mm. and things. Do you just avoid it? Yeah, I, th I think avoidance is is genuinely you know a very kind of useful tool. Sometimes it doesn't seem to be the most kind of proactive things thing to do, right? But oh no, I think hiding is a really great but, idea <laughs> under the duvet straight away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think actually. You know, I think uh, detaching yourself from social media is is probably kind of the the, the number one sort of piece of advice I'd give to uh, any any person who feels like you know um, they might be struggling in this day and age. Just because I think the influence of the internet and social media is so pervasive, and you know the advent of technology and and the internet's influence is only kind of you know, um, growing. Um, so yeah, I, I do kind of pull back and, and I have found that kind of limiting my sort of social media use and my interaction with technology um, to, you know, a very, very kind of specific uh, purpose um, is, is, is really, really beneficial to me. And I think it also kind of ensures that what I am putting out is, is hopefully uh, impacting people in the right way. I know that the, the, the various things that you struggled with um, made school quite a difficult period for you mm. so how did you kind of how did you find yourself in drama as a result at that time yeah um drama really kind of saved me i think more specifically laura lawson who was my drama teacher and the creator of school of comedy the the sketch show i ended up doing she really saved me you know um and i think between her and my parents being supportive of my interest in drama and I think acknowledging that my grades weren't necessarily going to make me a scientist or a, <laughs> um, an engineer or anything like that. Um, you know, they were supportive of me in the creative arts. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, those extracurriculum activities, those those arts, uh, you know, the dramas, uh, the, the the musics, you know, these these sorts of subjects are often kind of looked at as being soft or kind of like ancillary. And I think championing those are really important because you can't, uh, I think, overstate just what an amazing outlet it is for so many young people. Um, you know, I had learning difficulties at school and, um, you know, uh, I, I happened to feel a sense of comfort and belonging in the drama room. Um, and, you know, just because I didn't feel that in history or English doesn't mean that, you know, I'm any lesser as a student. And, and, I, and I hope that, you know, we continue to support the arts in this country because, um, you know, from a mental health perspective, I think it's really important that we're offering young people that outlet. It's true, and it's often overlooked, isn't it, in the whole discussion about the arts? You know, you were sort of told we need the arts, like we need, you know, nutrition. Yeah. But actually, you know, there are so many other aspects of it that that, that, that have a really important role, particularly with, with young people. Yeah. Um, you come from a, a really interesting family insofar as it's a kind of deeply rooted, caring, medical yeah. family. Your mum was a nurse. Uh, your father a doctor a uh, professor of Pro medicine yeah professor of medicine mm. so uh, did you feel at any point that you were taking a very sort of shallow superficial <laughs> path compared to all of them definitely you know and i'm constantly kind of reminded not by them but just by observing them you know of kind of where my job sits in the in the context of uh you know society and, and what's Im grounded. what's important yeah 100 percent. you know my older sister's a nurse my sister is um <clears throat> my, my my younger sister um is a uh, a teacher um at a, a sen school and my um my brother also like volunteers his time as a caretaker so Mum being a nurse, dad being a professor of cardiology. I'm surrounded by by people who kind of, uh, you know, are an inspiration. And um, and yeah, but they, but nonetheless, they were still supportive of of me wanting to do something different. And uh, you know, I couldn't I couldn't ask for a better support system. 
there must be a, a sort of sense of, of the incongruity, I suppose, in a way, when you do a Marvel film, even if it's your first um, uh, outing, you know, and you get paid fantastically well, and then you look at, you know, what your mother as a, as a nurse would right. be earning doing, doing a job like that. It must be something that kind of strikes you in terms of the, the contrast. 100%, I think, yeah, being, being conscious of that disparity. And, you know, certainly I think um, I'm aware of the fact that you know, uh, as actors, I think, you know, we're kind of over-celebrated quite, quite honestly. And I think uh, within society, we often look to people who are on the kind of biggest stages or under the kind of brightest spotlights. Um, but, you know, we, we often, uh, I think, overlook the people who really we all stand on the shoulders of, be it, be it nurses, be it doctors, be it, be it teachers. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, I can and where it's possible. I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with various organizations and charities, you know, and, and people who do, to my mind, the really, really kind of important work. And I'm just fortunate enough to be in a position where I can kind of pass the mic on occasion or point in the direction of people who I think are really making a, a very important difference. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the training, I mean, both, you know, in terms of just, you know, life and going through the pandemic and everything, but also in particular for for this movie. And I wondered how much more difficult it was made by the fact that you love food. <laughs> because I love food and the idea yeah. of having to go on any kind of restricted diet, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, they, I'm not sure any money would be enough, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, my love for food and the fact that one of my greatest talents is eating, actually, was definitely <laughs> at odds with my... Is it on your CV? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a light CV, so I put all sorts on there, uh, actor, and then I've got to fill it out somehow. Um, but yeah, I, I was fortunate though that you know um, Aaron Deer, my nutritionist, who I mentioned before, you know, he made sure that you know even though uh, the 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 challenges that came with following that diet were were there, um, it was still kind of tasty too on on. For, for the most part. But come on, I mean, I, I know p people sort of dismiss acting as, you know, where you just have to go and you do a performance. And that, Tell me how much work to, to do this particular part as Adam Warlock. Training, makeup, mm. costume, getting fitted on. How mm. much... How many hours of the day would that all take before you actually got to do your bit, which was the acting? I mean, to be honest, a lot of the... Apart from the training, you know, which which was which was kind of several months, you know, the the day to day work in order to kind of create Adam is nothing I can really take credit for until the cameras are rolling. Because before then, it's the work of the costume department, the makeup team, and 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 the hair team. So, the constructions of those looks, I mean, you know, they've poured months of of work into that, and then um, day to day, they're they're spending hours kind of actually sort of applying the makeup, applying the hair. So that. How long are you sitting there? Having probably two hours, <gasps> but you know, but I am sitting there, whereas they're they're really kind of executing. Um, and then, um, yeah, I can't. You know, the irony being, I'm a superhero and I can't even dress myself. You know, I, I couldn't even <laughs> bend over to put my own boots on. So and again, I'm not even crutches. doing that. I mean, and now honestly. I'm on crutches. <laughs> now I've got no hope. But uh, yeah, so 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 all of that credit goes to the people who work in those departments, and they're so talented. I mean, genuinely, to watch them at work every day was so cool and and they replicate the same look with a perfect level of continuity every single time under that kind of time pressure and and I really just kind of sit there my, my, my job doesn't really kick in until I've had a few coffees and uh, you know uh, I've got some lines to say I realised I, I said you love food and I just made you sound like you were just some very greedy person who just loved food well, but I mean I <laughs> am though to be honest <laughs> but you literally do love food I mean and you're, mm. you, I think you dabble in cooking and where was where was it born because you're also um, a, a particular I mean you like kind of a lot of very diverse food it's not kind of just like bring me my Meat. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I guess I grew up with my mum cooking. My mum um, uh, trained uh, at, at a cookery school, and uh, she's like the best cook I know. I know, I know. Like sons are very biased about their parents cooking. Like I know that there's a, you know, a lot of people will cite their their mum or their dad's food as being like their the best. But my 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 mum's is is particularly good. So I guess watching her, observing her. Um, I read a book called uh, Kitchen Confidential a number of years ago by Anthony Bourdain, who, you know, um, was one of my heroes, uh, the late, great Anthony Bourdain. I, I recommend it to anyone. So have you read that bit where he describes eating one of those tiny birds, those little songbirds? Oh, yes. It's so bad. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. 
Yeah, oh my gosh, you took me back there. Yeah, no, that was, that was, but anyway, we'll move yeah. on because that's really grotesque. But no, but that and was I, a turning I was, point. I was only reminded right. about it because I was reading um, Ben Goldsmith's um, brilliant new memoir. I'm going to be talking about uh, it with him tomorrow. And oh, he just, cool. he's got that, that paragraph in there and I just, oh, Ooh. no, bad, bad, bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's the food, the food bed. Yeah, that was that was definitely the thing that kind of like sparked my interest in it. And then ever since then, I've kind of been obsessed with chefs, and chefs have always been kind of rock stars to me. Um, and so, so which yeah. chef would you play? Are oh you a sort gosh. of Marco Pierre White, demented, deranged I, in the kitchen? <laughs> Are you a Gordon Ramsay? Like, oh, well, what? I, I can't, I, we can't actually do any of the words he would have used. I was going to say, I hope I take a kinder tone with my uh, brigade of chefs. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I. I love food from, as you kind of mentioned, like lots of different sort of cultures. I think, um, uh, you know, one of one of the one of the food cultures that I think is massively underrepresented at the fine dining level is is food of African origin. Um, and and the best restaurant I've been to recently is a restaurant called a Coco in London, and it was recently overlooked by Michelin, which I think is a great a great shame. Um, a Coco, I'm writing a cocoa, it down now. Yeah. What, what, from which region of Africa? So um, predominantly uh, West Africa. Um, but there have actually only ever been uh, four Michelin stars held by black chefs ever uh, since since Michelin's inception. Um, and there's currently one in America recently uh, uh, went there. But um, yeah, it's a massive oversight of food of African origin and, and black chefs in general. Um, but uh, a cocoa deserves a star that's just my and opinion. there's a lot of great african food actually in 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 london in general and unbelievable i'm not amount. so sure about other parts of the country but i know we're spoiled for choice we're really spoiled here yeah, yeah quite like a bit of eritrean myself eritrean food's incredible yeah mm. absolutely and there's a great place in chavitz bush but i can't remember the name of it oh. um now i know there's another obsession of yours that we do have to briefly touch on which is collecting trainers yeah. not quite as wholesome um <laughs> No, more soulsome. Yeah. <laughs> more soulsome, very yeah. good, baboon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, why collecting trainers? And I believe you, you favour one firm as well. Are you are you looking for a, a contract <laughs> by any chance? I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty. Um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty loyal to Nike, um, but that's just out of genuine, you know, l love for, for the brand. Uh, I, I'm not, like, officially tied up or anything like that. It's only a matter of time. Um, yeah. It's only a matter of time, Will. <laughs> I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be mad if that happened, of course. But no, uh, yeah, I do have... A, a, I'm not a collector per se because... I sort of can't wear resist wearing them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I have limited myself. Like I haven't got sort of like a warehouse of shoes or anything like that. But I just really appreciate footwear. It's my one slightly guilty pleasure as far as like, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of collecting is concerned. It would be slippers for the next couple of months, won't you? Yeah, I can only wear one at a time at the moment because of the boot that I have to wear for my fractured ankle. That's yeah. good, less wear and tear. I think you've got the... I don't think I asked you, from playing basketball, very from sporty. Playing training, basketball. Training, was it? Or, yeah, no, or this playing. was this was playing a sport I had no business even attempting. It's the second time I've, I've rolled my ankle playing basketball. And if that's not a sign that I'm too British and I should just kind of pair back and, and yeah, know my, know my place and stick to football, then uh, <laughs> I don't know what is. Just fine. Finally, um, you know, I mean, obviously a great career highlight and triumph, snogging Jennifer Aniston at the age of 19. Well, I feel sorry uh, for Jennifer, and it was definitely <laughs> in character and not outside of uh, of the requirements of work. But, but I mean, she's gorgeous. Um, how would you top that? I mean, how are you going to top that? I mean... Oh, look, Je Jennifer's such a wonderful person. I, getting to work with Jennifer, you know, was amazing. Um, someone I'd admired... Uh, for a long time while watching Friends and... Uh, Were you a teenage Friends addict? Yeah, me and my sister grew up watching Friends together and collecting the DVDs. Well, we that must have felt really weird when you had to kiss box her set. Well, I just, I just, as I say, I just feel sorry for Jen, but she was very sweet about it. And anyone who's ever done an on-screen kiss knows that it's the least romantic thing and the most awkward and technically sort of strange thing to kind of do. But she was very, very uh, sweet about it. And, um, you know, as, as a young, quite nervous actor in that scenario, um, she she put me at ease and I, I appreciated that because I was I was shaking like a leaf. And just finally, playing a, a, a Marvel character, um, you obviously want them to return, I presume, but there is also that element where they can take over your life, can't they? A bit like, I don't know, playing Batman or something like that. Is right. that something that you kind of 
think about and how important is it for you to sort of balance people's perception of you as a as a Marvel hero uh, a, mm. alongside the fact that you've been a brilliant character actor for the course of your career since since you emerged <clears throat> as a child. That's kind of you to say. I mean, I, first of all, I feel really lucky that it's my job first and foremost, you know, and, I, and, and I've worked to the extent that I have. I think as an actor, you can never kind of take that for granted and, and lose sight of how lucky you are to be in relatively consistent work. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had my periods without work for sure. But, um, you know, when something like this comes along, you know, there is a sort of at least a chance of a certain kind of longevity or um, there's there's a chance of kind of uh, consistency. And, and that's hard to, to come by, particularly, you know, in, in the context of films as kind of beloved and well supported as the Marvel films are. So I'm really, really grateful and, and uh, definitely no complaints. Uh, and also Marvel have been very, very good, I think, over the years about you know, um, introducing actors and accommodating their other kind of um, pursuits and and, and uh, engagements, you know. And I think at the point where you have people like, you know, Angela Bassett and Natalie Portman and, um, you know, uh, you, you, you have Jake Gyllenhaal, you know, these, these huge actors, um, you know, you have to be able to accommodate their kind of schedules. So mine is a relatively light lift, I think, for them. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's getting fantastic reviews and you've done a brilliant job Thank as you so always much. and it's a delight to talk to you. We'll find it.